I'm uh, David Frame, like Ben had mentioned, and um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. And yeah, my presentation is going to be on kind of a specific subject. I'm actually a veterinarian. I've um, I am board certified in poultry pathology and um, spent some time at the University of California, Davis, um, actually in the Turlock lab before coming to Utah and working as the chief veterinarian for Moroni Feed Company um, in central Utah for about 12 years and then joined the, the faculty at um, Utah State University in the Animal Dairy and Veterinary Sciences Department uh, in 98. So I've been around for a while um, and it uh, seems like I'm getting older every day too. But anyway, we'll see what we can do. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is, is visit with you about some of the, the, the common things that you might find in small flock poultry. Uh, this can either be uh, just a few in the backyard or um, if we're talking about uh, small flocks that you're trying to uh, sell eggs or um, meat to farmers markets or whatever. Hey David, but, uh, do you want to go into presenter mode? There right. we go. Perfect, thanks. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is the elephant in the room and that's Merrick's disease. And I get more calls on Merrick's um, situations and people not quite understanding what it's all about. Uh, and it is a, a very complicated uh, situation. The, the first thing is this is a virus. And uh, remarkably, this was the first tumor virus or the first cancer that um, a vaccine was developed for way back, um, you know, about a century ago. And um, or decades ago anyway. And so um, it's really interesting from that standpoint. Um, another important thing to know that it, it occurs worldwide and basically all chickens are going to be exposed to the virus at some point in their life. Unless you have a specific pathogen free birds somewhere, which none of us have in the backyard, these are in laboratory settings, you're going to have uh, eventually an exposure to Merrick's disease. Now the host range uh, is chickens primarily, but it can also uh, infect uh, Japanese quail, turkeys, and pheasants. Um, like I say, it's worldwide and is, is basically ubiquitous. The transmission is direct contact with the virus itself or by indirect contact on, on dander, uh, dust, That'll, that'll occur uh, during hatch or during um, brooding, basically. And um, there is little evidence that it can be vertic vertically transmitted. That is from the hen to the egg to the chick. And so uh, it, it's going to be found in the environment and that's where the, the chickens are going to uh, be exposed to it. Uh, there are also mechanical vectors and um, the darkling beetle is one that is, is, is known to carry Merrick's disease and it can get in um, deep litter. And a few years ago, uh, it wasn't a problem in Utah, but uh, it, it's becoming more and more of a problem, particularly in the commercial um, end of things where, there, where birds are on litter. Uh, contaminated feed and water are also a source of the virus itself. Now, there's a lot of different manifestations of uh, Merrick's disease. It can cause lymphomas, which are tumors, and um, this occurs in layers, in breeder stock, and in broilers. And um, so what you might find is open a, a bird up and you'll, you'll see these, these pale, large, lumps in the liver or in um, inside the bird somewhere. And another, uh, probably the most common uh, way it's going to show up is in, in layer type birds, uh, you'll have nerve lesions and it'll affect the, the legs so that um, that you will, uh, will have paralysis and it'll drag one leg behind itself. Um, uh, sometimes a wing will droop. And uh, so that's, that's basically what I get the call for is that, hey, my, my birds are lame, uh, what's going on? Skin lesions are most common in your meat type birds. Um, 
and they'll often occur in the feather follicles and so you'll get these enlarged feather follicles and so you when, when you go to to uh, take the feathers off of these uh, chickens you'll uh, you'll see all these lumps and bumps all over in there and then eye lesions are probably the rarest occurrence but if they do occur it'll probably be in your layer um, type breeds Here's a really, real typical example of a, of a chicken that uh, has the, the, the paralysis. It affects the, uh, the nerves of the, of the legs and um, it, uh, a typical splay legged appearance will, will happen in a case like this. But like I say, you can also have problems with, with wings um, and occasionally with, with neck problems too, but uh, usually it's the, the the legs that caused the, the big deal. And I apologize for the misfocus on this thing, but I hope you can appreciate that there's, there's an irregularity shape in that pupil. It's not a good round pupil right there. And that's because these, these um, tumor cells are invading the iris of the eye and causing uh, that pupil to, to be uh, not perfectly rounded. You, you can see that hopefully. Okay, what we want to talk about uh, now are, what about breaks? Okay, there's a lot of things that are going to cause losses from Merrick's disease. Now, in the, in the hatchery, in commercial, in big commercial areas, they use what's called a, a cell-associated vaccine. It's a really good uh, vaccine. It's usually a SB1 type or an HVT combination of it. Um, now, some places are, are using even vector vaccines. Um, but... Um, but generally speaking, um, vaccination at the hatchery is the way to go. Now, if that vaccine is improperly taken care of, um, cell associated vaccines need to be stored in liquid nitrogen. And, um, and so they have to be treated correctly and then not uh, left very long before they're administered into the bird. Uh, some of your smaller, uh, hatcheries will probably use a, a cell-free vaccine, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if um, that vaccine is, is mistreated or if they're injecting incorrectly and it falls on the floor, not, not in the bird's neck, um, it's not doing your birds any good. And then you could have a poor vaccination procedure. And then when you, when you get out in the, in the field, um, into the brooder building you'll, and uh, into the grow out, you'll start seeing problems like this. Now, I need to mention, uh, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but you'll usually start seeing Merrick's um, mortality and um, paralysis and things like that um, at about 22 weeks of age, uh, just before they, just about the time they go into lay. And it's usually a disease of young birds, um, say a year old, but it can occur as late as two year old birds. So it's a, it's a fairly young bird situation. So if you have a poor vaccination procedure, that could be a cause. Um, now, cell-free vaccines are the ones, the only um, real feasible type that you're gonna be able to get. You can go out and buy these vaccines. Um, they, uh, you have to administer them very quickly um, in the age of the bird, because if they're exposed to the virus and they get the wild type virus first, uh, these aren't gonna work as well. Now, there are some talk that uh, maternal antibody concentration is a little bit of an inhibiting factor on these uh, vaccines that you can give uh, out in the field. But um, in, in theory, that's true. In reality, that's not. Now, for those who don't know what maternal antibodies are, that would be actually antibodies to Merrick's disease that the hen is putting inside the egg. And then the chick hatches, and it has um, protection for a week or two. Um, for, of, from the disease itself. They can also neutralize the virus, um, obviously, and so you wanna make sure you get that concentration into them correctly at that time. Um, dander, infection, infected dust, uh, ineffective disinfection can all play roles in early exposure to the virus, which then um, makes this more problematic as far as your vaccination goes. And um, genetic susceptibility plays somewhat of a role too. Um, it seems like your lighter breeds are, are a little bit more susceptible to it. Um, 
the uh, all all breeds are, are susceptible to some uh, point, and it just depends on how virulent the exposure is, uh, the virus that's exposing them, how much they get, and all that kind of stuff in the field exposure. So even with the best intentions of vaccinating, uh, if you have a, a very virulent uh, uh, MD virus out there somewhere on your place, then you can still have losses. Uh, in a case like that, you'd want to depopulate, clean up pretty good, and, um, and then go from there. So the control of Marix is by vaccination. The, the key is it's got to be early within the first few hours of the chick's life, if possible. And it must be of sufficient um, uh, amount in there and dosage so that it overcomes uh, any, any kind of the maternal antibody and, and gets that uh, chick off to a good start. Now, um, the, the virus inside of a, of a bird that does not show any clinical signs, um, what it does is it causes an immune response in there and then they, it forms natural antibodies and it, it controls the, the virus so you don't see lameness, you don't see tumors, you don't see that type of thing. Um, however, susceptible birds will be exposed to the virus uh, and for some reason don't mount a sufficient antibody response to control the virus. And then that's when, when you get the tumors and the, and the leg problems and, and so forth. And so it's just a, it's usually a small amount of birds in a flock that'll do that. But um, occasionally, you know, you can get some fairly good outbreaks. Uh, genetic selection, um, you really can't select for an MD um, um, type of uh, strain that will completely be uh, resistant to, to the virus. However, there are strains that um, are more susceptible uh, than others. And about uh, 35 or 40 years ago, there was a strain of Seabri bantams that um, were very susceptible to the disease. And, um, and so they, that was a, a strain that you would want to get rid of and get something better. But uh, if we could, select genetically to get rid of Marek's disease, that would have been done a long time ago. Um, and so it's really not a, a, a viable way to do it, but, uh, but occasionally you will see a strain that is more susceptible than others. Okay, we're gonna move on to um, northern, some of the mite problems and some of your out, uh, things that occur on the outside of the bird. There's basically three types of mites that I want to talk about, northern fowl mite, or Ornithonissus silvierum, the red mite, which is Dermonissus gallinae, and the scaly leg mite, which is Nematocoptes mutans. The northern fowl mite is a real common one around here. It's, as the name says, it's found in northern climates. You're going to find it in everything from cage layers to range turkeys to exhibition birds, um, even pheasants and other uh, types of uh, corralled fowl, too. Uh, cold weather. You'll find it there. The life cycle is as little as one week. And uh, all the life cycles occur on the host with this particular breed um, uh, species of, of, of mite. But it can, after it's fed and taken a blood meal, it can live off, birds, off the bird um, for as long as a few weeks in the litter and in other places. Uh, signs of, of mite infestation in your birds are a soiled looking vent, discolored feathers. You might see some scabs. Uh, these are mainly around the vent. Uh, you, you might see some movement of salt and pepper looking uh, stuff around the vent. And um, just look for a minute if it moves, it's, it's mites. Um, the definitive way to know is to pick up the chicken and handle it for a few minutes and then, then wait. And what'll happen, those mites will get on you. You can feel them crawling up your, your arms. You'll feel them in your hair, but don't despair. Just go and take a shower. You'll be fine. They're not gonna hurt you. There's uh, a lot of legends out there of um, mites infect, in, infecting people. Um, that's usually a, a transitory thing. It's not going, they're not gonna start living off of you. Um, and so uh, don't, don't worry about that too much. Um, now the control of this, there's really one approved dust uh, that you want to go, that you want to use. It's called Prozap. Um, you want to apply this to the vent area and also under the wings and back. And so it's going to require you to, to handle uh, your birds 
individually. You want to make sure you apply it weekly for at least three weeks. This is important because this, the life cycle of the mite is such that certain stages of its life cycle is resistant to any kind of insecticides. And so you want to make sure you get them during the whole life cycle. Um, remove the litter from the floor and nest boxes and spray coop and nest boxes and perch areas with an approved insecticide. So once the chickens are out of there, you can, you can, you can uh, spray with something that uh, is, a, is approved for um, this type of thing. And then you put your chickens back after. You want to screen out your wild birds, uh, which is important because they can carry the, this mite and uh, also lice, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and uh, on your runs, if you can, put a netting over those runs and keep the birds out. It'll save you not only from getting um, parasites in there, but it'll also save you from um, having those birds eat all the chicken feed that you've purchased. Here's a picture of a um, northern fowl mite. Um, and these things will take a blood meal. And um, like I say, they can fall off the bird, stay there for a while, um, or else they can just stay on the bird and then lay their eggs. And uh, they'll go through certain uh, instar stages and then become a, an adult mite. Uh, these do suck blood, uh, as opposed to the lice that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so these can cause some problems. The red mite is probably the most dangerous. It's not as common uh, around here, but I have seen it. Um, its life cycle is very similar. It can survive a long time off the host and it'll feed on the bird at night and then hide in the crevices. So the way, your best way of, of diagnosing this mite is, the, is a hammer. You go in and uh, just take a hammer and take a, uh, underneath a ro roost or a perch or something like that and, and take that up. And if you, you see in the crack, um, something that looks like blood moving around, then it's the, these mites. Um, they're, they can reduce egg production and weight gain. And in some cases, these mites can cause uh, mortality in your birds too. Um, the good part about it is both of them are controlled in basically the same way. Uh, use your ProZap, but uh, you're going to have to have a little extra focus on getting in those uh, cracks, crevices in the building. Um, and of course, you want to remove that litter, spray, and then put in fresh litter. Scaly leg mite is only going to be found in, in older birds, um, uh, usually over two years old. And um, it's very common in exhibition uh, poultry uh, where you're breeding the birds for, um, you know, where you take them to shows and stuff like that, because you have a tendency to have older birds at that point. These are microscopic, so you can't see them but they burrow under the scales of the shanks and the feet and they cause irritation. And then before long, you'll start seeing um, these, the scales on the feet start to look like they're sticking out. Um, with a severe infestation, it can be irreversible because it can get right down in, toward, into the bone and the tendons and cause some problems. Um, but if you're on it quick enough, you can, you can um, reverse it. The life cycle is about two weeks. This is what it looks like. And uh, this is a pretty severe case uh, on a silky. And you can see that those uh, scales are pretty enlarged and, and large, and also they are sticking up. The mites are very microscopic. They're actually a sarcoptes mite. And so the only way you can see them is to scrape down underneath those scales and um, uh, look at them under the microscope. Hey, David, the, you've got five minutes till questions. OK. Um, thanks, and you missed my 10 minute one. <laughs> the scaly leg mite, um, this can be controlled with, with petroleum jelly and um, you work this under the scales and uh, it works pretty good, it suffocates them. So um, anyway, I'm only gonna get through a few of this. Um, the depluming mite is one rule out in um, complaints of feather loss, but you really have to take a deep scraping around the feather follicles to find these. And um, uh, probably the last thing I'll, I want to talk about um, uh, besides the question time is the chicken body louse. These chew on, on the birds and uh, their entire life cycle is, is longer than, than a mite, um, but you can have scabby feathers, uh, feather deformity. The control is same as, as, as mites. And so that's the good thing about it, but you can see them um, 
under the skin or under in, inside the feathers, but they chew. They don't. They don't suck on the skin. Now, um, coccidiosis is a real issue, and uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of this unless somebody has some some uh, questions. But uh, basically, um, the things you want to do is if you if you start seeing hunched over birds and you've had uh, usually flocks of chickens in there before, um, you might be might get this. Now remember that um, the coccidiosis is species specific. And so the ones that get your calves and so forth uh, that infect calves or turkeys or anything else aren't gonna infect your chickens. Um, inside the gut, they look, it looks pretty bad. Uh, you, you diagnose them with a microscope and that's what they look like. And uh, we can get to the treatment. So if you see something that's um, severe outbreak, it can occur in one thing. And if you remember this, you'll, um, it'll be important for you. And that's if you have wet litter, and then it dries out and then it gets wet again, you can have a problem with this. And the treatment is Amprolium. Uh, I've got the, um, the dosage there for you, but you've got to uh, treat them and then wean them off the amprolium to develop leakage because you want a few in there uh, because they'll self-vaccinate when they do.